properly. What I want to do is talk a little bit about, uh, well, who's here? And of course, I don't know because many of you will be listening after the fact. And that's cool. Um, I do like to know where you're from in terms of if you live west of the five, you're coastal. And that's a particular climate zone all in and of itself. People east of the five really will have an easier time with citrus. Those west of the five will have a few problems, and I'll be talking about them. I want to look at citrus from the top down. I want to talk about care. I'll have to mention water because it's important. It's still an issue, and it's important to the citrus. Uh, we'll step into the kitchen. We'll talk a little about pests. And then I hope to answer the question, should you run out and buy one? And you'll note the, the uh, picture here that almost all of these things are from my garden. That's an orange tree that came with a house. I don't even know what it was. It's not a navel, but it's quite productive and it's lolling all over my back garage. So it looks pretty in the garden. What to get? Well, there's only 900 plus. I mean, what a problem. Uh, think about what to eat. Think about what you like and what you might cook with if you had it available. And don't just think eating fresh fruit. You can put it in a marinade, dressing. You can make preserves. You can make candies. There are a lot of things. You can even mainline it, and I'll mention that. You also want to think about your garden. What you know? What's the style of your garden, and, and where might a citrus look great? Because they are very pretty when they are in bloom and when they are in fruit. And I know... I think all of you are retired um, and a lot of retired people have a seasonal lifestyle. So think about that. Do you, for instance, go skiing in the winter? So there's no sense having something that you harvest when you're away. Maybe you go to a summer house in the summer or Hawaii in the fall, whatever. Uh, take that into account when choosing your citrus. Okay. So what do you like to eat? Fresh fruit, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, you can use things like lemon juice and lime juice uh, as a substitute for vinegar in a dressing or a marinade or something like that. I've been using, I have a Mexican lime, which is key lime. You might know it as key lime. It's a low acid, but it is, it is acid and it has pleasant flavor. So I think it's better than vinegar. Of course, some of the vinegars, the flavored vinegars, can be very nice too. Um, I have a citrus planer, which lets me get zest easily, and you can toss that into almost anything. It's wonderful. And I even preserve lemons when I have too much of a harvest. Uh, pack them with salt in a jar, and they'll give you tart plus salt flavor. Um, others like orange juice, sweet or pigment. And I like to stir fry thinly sliced orange slices with the rind. It's surprising when you stir fry them. Uh, the, the rind becomes quite edible and delicious. So, you know, garnish it with orange blossoms, pair it with chocolate. How can you not like it? You can cook with it. Um, Etrog is used uh, as a traditional meal. Um, I think I talked about flavoring, zest. My grandmother made candy grapefruit rind. I still have her recipe. And the grapefruit rind, of course, wasn't sweet to start with, but by the time grandma finished candying it, it sure was. She also used what she called citron. And I think those were preserved pieces from a Buddha's hand citron. If you're not familiar with that, Here's a picture. This picture was taken from the California Rare Fruit Growers website. And these things right here are what they call handed citron or Buddha's hand. They are really um, highly aromatic. You put one in a pretty bowl on the front table and the whole room will be perfumed. Um, they're also fairly hard to find, but you can find them at your local farmer's market, most likely. You need to worry about your garden conditions. And okay, those of you west of the five, citrus really wants eight hours of sun every day. I live five blocks from the Pacific Ocean. I simply don't get eight hours of sun. And so it doesn't stop me from growing citrus, 
but the yield is a little lower and it takes a little extra effort. Um, if you have a, a south facing stone wall, uh, it will, you, if you plant right in front of that, the heat will come in, the sun will come in when it does come in and heat the, the stone wall, which will slowly radiate its heat back out in the evening and overnight. And so that will uh, basically coax the citrus a little further with a little extra heat. Um, there's dark stone mulch that I think it was a UCLA professor, Diamond, who wrote uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel and talked about some of the native tribes in New Guinea using, they lived in a very coastal, very challenging environment for growing things, but they had lots of black volcanic rock and they used it as a mulch. And just like a stone wall, it will heat up during the day and then release its heat in the evening and at night. So again, you can fool the plants into thinking it's a little warmer than it is. You can also choose an early variety, and I'm going to be talking about that. Um, also, and this is one thing I did with my, I had a grapefruit, it came with a house, and I had the hardest time ripening it because I don't have a lot of heat, and grapefruit really wants heat. And I talked with the master gardener and advisor, and he said, well, Cindy, just leave it on the tree longer, because what happens is there are a whole lot of flavor components the sugars will build with heat. You're not getting much heat. The fruit naturally has uh, acids, but if you leave the fruit on the tree, the acid will drop. And hopefully you wait long enough until the acid and the sugars kind of balance and that's when you harvest it. In the coastal environment, you're still missing some of the flavor components, but, but it's certainly edible grapefruit. Uh, don't bother to try the after um, after harvest ripening. Once you pull it off the tree, that's what it is. I kind of get a bang out of this chart. We are different here. You know, we've been growing commercial citrus since the 49ers. That's one of the ways people made money during the gold rush of 1849. And in fact, they made more providing food for the miners than the miners ever got from the gold that they dug out. But that means we've been doing this about 175 years. So we know quite a bit about what it takes to make productive citrus. And I'm gonna tell you that too. Okay, drainage is important. If you have heavy soil, you may need to use a raised bed because if you leave, if you plant citrus in wet, soggy soil or a place where it remains wet and soggy, you're gonna struggle with root rot, which is Phytophthora. And that'll eventually kill the tree. I think it's kind of curious that natives in the Southwest use something that's basically sunken beds. If you dig, uh, like imagine an alluvial fan, the water comes down when it does rain, which doesn't happen often. But if you direct, uh, direct a lot of that water, to one place and plant in that place, then the, the plants there will do better because they'll essentially get more water than all the other areas around. Um, so that, that worked well for them. And yet here we are worrying about too much water rather than too little. Uh, you also have to worry about minimum temperatures. I can't tell what your minimum temperatures are uh, if you're inland, you may get frost and you may have to worry with cold temps. Also, if you're at high elevation. Near the beach, I have never had any frost. And it's funny, uh, my boss asked me to write an article about frost tolerance and, and how to deal with frost, which I dutifully did. And then she said, okay, Cindy, we need some photos with this. So... I knew you could try holiday light strings if you get the old kind that are incandescent because they put out a bit of heat, okay? So I had to put together um, a little tree, the tree on the left, my little kumquat is in a pot and I stuck some, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a cord leading to the pot and holiday light strings. Then I snuck out at night to take a picture and hey, it was kind of dramatic. 
So that would have been enough if I'd had frost to keep my citrus warm enough and, and guard from the frost. Um, then there's some things you need to think about what you want, how you want things to look, okay? Style of your house and garden. Citrus can almost fit in with anything. And it can be from small to large. It'll get as small as four feet. You notice my kumquat in that pot was about two feet high. If you put it in a pot, it'll it'll stay a little smaller. A full-size citrus will be 30 feet. And there are ones all the way in between. We'll talk about that. And it takes two espaliers. So if you have a, a wall or a fence and not a lot of depth uh, next to it, you can espalier a, a fruit tree, a citrus, and it will still be productive. It, it's a lot more work, but it sure does look pretty. Oh, dear. Um, I'm having an attack of seagulls at my window. They're, they're playing with the cats. I'm going to ignore it. Uh, and then I said uh, the seasonal availability. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about harvest schedule and maintenance. And you need to think about that if you're going to be away. Here is a chart. This one came from uh, Tom Delotel, who was a horticulturist in the South Bay. He's now moved to Washington State. He had a nursery for quite a while, and he used to teach at Southwestern College. I took one of his classes there, and I got this handout. And it turns out if you go online and start looking for citrus variety harvest dates, you'll find a number of tables. They don't all agree. But this one is fairly general, and this one is in your handout. I know it's an eye chart, okay? So get it from the handout. You'll find it easier to read. But the nice thing is that you can choose things, well, in my garden. The earliest is uh, a kishu, which is not on here. It's a mandarin that starts in November. And then I have a gold nugget. Well, let's see, the, or the Kishu went until March this year. That gold nugget there is from March to July. Oh, dear. What happened? Wait a minute. Hold on. I touched something I shouldn't have touched. Uh, the gold nugget is from March to July. I have a Valencia, I think it is. It's not a navel. And that's May to October. And then in November, my Kishu starts up again. So I get citrus 12 months of the year. You can do that, too, with just three trees. Not that you need to put in three. But no matter what time of year you want citrus, you can find one. Okay? And like I say, this one's in the handout. The height it's going to achieve, you go to the nursery and you wonder how big it's going to be, depends in part on the cultivar, what, which kind you choose, the variety. It also depends on the rootstock. There are three choices, full size, which will get to 30 feet, semi-dwarf, and dwarf. And the dwarf is the little one can be kept to four feet, or as you saw with my um, kumquat, I keep it down to about two feet and with no trouble at all because it's in a container, and that'll give you a little extra height reduction. You do have to be careful in the container because... You have to pay close attention to irrigation, feeding, and root pruning. Because if you don't give the plant what it needs, it cannot put roots out somewhere else to go find it. It's stuck in the pot. So you do have to be a little more diligent in your care if you're using a pot. Trouble is, there are two different systems for dwarfing. I don't know who thought this up. It's probably not too late to shoot whoever it was, but we don't know who it was. I've mentioned the dwarf, semi-dwarf, and full size. That's the original system. Someone came along, probably somebody who didn't have dwarf stock, and said, well, there's double dwarf, dwarf, and full size. So if I say dwarf, do you know how big it's going to get? And the answer is no, you can't tell, okay? You can't tell unless you know the root stock. And that's something that's on the label of every tree at the nursery. It's not prominent, but it's it's there around the trunk, and you can tell what it is. If it's really dwarf, four to eight feet, it means it's growing on flying what's called flying dragon rootstock. This is an ancient uh, cultivar 
one of the original citrus, its fruit are about the size of a marble and nothing but seeds, but it is a citrus. And it's a very tough citrus and it's got good thermal properties. In other words, it'll stand fairly cold temperatures and it'll do a number of other things. So good rootstock. If you want the intermediate, that is the either semi-dwarf or what they call dwarf in the new system, that's trifoliate C35 or carizo. So you can read the label and know how big it's gonna get, okay? All trees are grafted, uh, partially, not just for growth habit, but for temperature and soil organism resistance and some other reasons, okay? You don't get an orange or a citrus without a graft. And you can tell even years later where the bud union was, okay? Look at this lump, that's what that is, and so, if there are any suckers that grow from below that, I want to tear them off because they're coming from a flying dragon and I'll get fruit the size of a marble. I do have a number of flying dragon trees. Um, trouble is they take longer to establish, um, longer to first harvest. They kind of sit there for a couple, three years and then bingo, finally, they really go. They give full size fruit and they give a lot of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, my Kishu, which is established now, I think this year has 700 fruit on it. Last year it had about 600. Uh, way more than two of us can eat. And so we eat what we can, and then I generally call in the folks from Second Harvest, or I just pick it myself and take it to the local food bank. But it's basically what you want to share. Um... You want to think about keeping the tree, either buying it in the first place to only get that high or keeping it the, the height that you can really manage and harvest. There's no sense having something 30 feet off the ground. You can't get to it. You have to wait till it falls down. Whereas if it's only six to eight feet, you can get to it with a step stool and it makes a lot more sense. Um, and here's some varieties that are naturally small, smaller anyway. You can prune for size, but it's it's a big deal. And I have a website here, um, again from Tom Delotel, and he talks about taking a grapefruit down in size. Turns out it's my grapefruit, or it was my grapefruit until I tore it out. Uh, he, I hired him to reduce the size of the grapefruit and he took good photos and then he made up a website. So you can go see my yard, my old yard at that URL. At the very least, you should be pruning to keep the interior of your trees clean. What happens is a tree is kind of like a globe and it grows out in all directions and the leaves on the outside shade what's inside. What doesn't get shade, basically the leaves kind of die off and you'll get dead twigs. So you can prune a lot of dead wood out of a citrus without changing the look of the tree at all, but it does let the air flow through, which helps some of the problems I'm gonna be talking about in a moment. Uh, and the California Rare Fruit Growers website, again in the handout, has wonderful photos and lots and lots of material. I really think that citrus is the consummate edible, okay? It's got history. Louis XIV had his orangerie, and Paris is at a latitude of 49 degrees. I mean, that's, uh, I think, further north than New York, okay? Now, King Louis XIV also had a whole lot of garden help and a whole lot of money, so he could do that, but he did have producing citrus trees, and uh, that set the tone, of course. A lot of the old masters show lemons and Buddha's hand citron uh, perfuming the medieval mansion because it was considered, because these things are uh, perishable and can only be grown where it's hot, to have them in Northern Europe was obviously a show of wealth. You can also think about a row of potted citrus trees with whitewashed trunks. Whitewashing is a technique that you have to use if you prune the trees significantly, because 
citrus and avocado, by the way, the, the trunks and branches can be prone to sunburn. And if you prune away all the leaf, the leaf cover, you'll have sunburn unless you citrus, unless you whitewash. It's easy. Take any uh, latex paint, light color, 50-50 with water, paint it on. Uh, doesn't harm the tree. Looks good or can look good. And it protects it from sunburn. Oh, and then my favorite, fresh oranges with Cointreau. Uh, I had this, uh, I was living in Europe in the 60s, and I remember visiting one professor's house, and with great flourish, he brought out some gorgeous looking oranges that had come from Israel, because at that time, that was about the closest place where you could grow it, or one of the places. And uh, he sliced them thick, put them in a beautiful bowl, and splashed them with Cointreau. So that was our dessert. And I have to admit, they were really good. Simple, effective, nice. Okay, so what's the list? Choose your cultivar based on the size and rootstock. Plant it in a right place, eight hours of sun. Feed it three times a year for label directions. And I'm gonna talk a little more about that. Citrus or heavy feeders. Then wash the tree after you feed it. And I'll show you some pictures of what happens when you don't do that. And I like to, I say deep water every three to four weeks. Depends on where you live. If you're in Valley Center or Hamul, probably you can't go four weeks between waterings. But citrus want deep and infrequent. What you want to do is wet the soil to the depth of the roots, which can be three feet down. And the top of the soil can dry out. That's okay. The citrus will still get moisture deeper. And that will encourage it to keep deep roots, which makes it quite drought tolerant. Then, of course, you have to thin it if you get to so much fruit that you're going to break the branches. I mentioned eight hours a day of sun. It's always good to check your drainage. Um, like I say, I'm four blocks from the water. I, I garden in sand, which brings its own challenges. Uh, when I did my last citrus, okay, you dig a one by one by one foot hole. That's the most work. You fill it once to wet the soil. Then you fill it a second time and test to see how long it takes to drain. If it's over 24 hours, don't plant there because you're not getting decent drainage. In my case, I had to use a timer and my soil, the, the one by one by one foot hole, drained so fast, it was equivalent of 55 inches per hour, okay? That's what you get with sand. Of course, the same thing happens when you irrigate later, but it's a different it's a different environment, and I, I, I would take that over adobe any day, but I guess it's the devil you know. Uh, you want to locate your tree where you can get it water. Don't plant it in a lawn, please because then you'll be watering the lawn for the lawn's needs and it has three inch roots. That won't do very well for citrus. And don't let the weeds invade. Okay, I said they're heavy feeders. You should get some citrus food or if it's called citrus and avocado, that's it. And also get something called micronutrients plus iron and a couple of photos are coming up, okay. Turns out citrus food doesn't include citrus needs. That's why you get the micronutrients plus iron. You sprinkle it according to package directions all the way out to the drip line. So as far as the leaves go out, that's where you want to put the food all the way that far out from the trunk. And then I like to say wash it. I have a hose in sprayer. Uh, I use New Dawn, but it, the brand is absolutely inconsequential. Um, you don't want it too soapy. And if you're where it's hot, you want to rinse it also. Basically, that water's in the food. And it washes off a multitude of problems. I'll show you photos in a minute. Here are a couple of bags. Now, I last gave this talk, I think it was in 2018. So these numbers are old, but they're still characteristic. Uh, the blue one on the left just says citrus and avocado. The green one or yellow one on the right is organic, okay? 
course, we're dealing with minerals here and minerals are never organic. So what they've done is they've added a little humus and then they could slap on the organic title. Each bag has a back of bag. I know you can't read it. I've done the hard work for you. Here we go. The blue one is 1448. That's uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, phosphorus, potassium. Um, 1448 are the percentages. You're basically getting the blue bag at $1.06 per pound. The yellow bag, you're getting $1.50 per pound. And per pound has only half the nitrogen. So since you basically want it for nitrogen, you can pay three times as much or you can get the blue bag. All right. And like I say, these prices are a little earlier, but you might want to look at uh, what you're buying versus the cost of it. But really, any citrus food will do. Because you're going to make up for what it's missing with one of these. And I've shown you the contents of, you know, the magnesium, sulfur, iron. These are trace minerals. Citrus doesn't need it in great quantity, but it does need it. Okay. And when you get this iron plus, you're making sure that you're giving your citrus everything it needs. Remember, 175 years taught us we know what citrus needs, and that's what it needs. There are a couple of charts here I'm just going to step through because I know you can go back later and read these things. These are, if you're seeing different kinds of deficiency signs in the leaves, what it may be from. And there's some more. There are a whole lot of them because, like I say, citrus is heavy feeder and needs these things in some amount. Irrigation is important. And I really like micro spray. I get it at my big box store. I get the parts at my big box store. Uh, yes, your specialty irrigation places have wonderful micro spray parts and designs, but they're not open on the weekends. And for some reason, that's the only time I break my citrus irrigation parts and need new ones. Uh, you don't want to wet the trunk. Remember, if you're just planting from a nursery can, the root ball is about as big as the nursery can, and you need to water more often until it gets established and begins sending roots out into the soil. So water to a depth of one foot initially and deeper as the tree grows. Of course, Mother Nature should give you a break, and boy, this year we've had a break. It may not happen again next year. Here's what happens if you don't wash. Uh, sooty mold, things that blow in, it's nothing you've done that's wrong. It just comes in. Scale is very common. Powdery mildew, especially at the beach. And I'm, I'm talking like a coastal gardener now. Ants will come in, Argentine ants, and they will farm the scale. That is to say, they'll move it around to different parts of the tree, and they'll fight with and sometimes kill the predators that would otherwise be going after the scale. Um, you can use something like tanglefoot, which is basically, uh, kind of looks like Vaseline in a tube. It's sticky stuff. And put a piece of lint, roofing paper or landscape cloth around the main trunk, and then you apply this sticky stuff, and basically it physically keeps the ants from climbing up the trunk. You do have to be sure that you've not let the branches hang down onto a fence or a garage roof like mine, and the ants can get up that way, okay? But when you wash periodically, you, you're getting rid of a lot of the junk that's just dirt and, and uh, uh, honeydew and whatever else. It won't wash off all scale, for instance, but it lets you see what evils remain. And here are two shameful photos from my garden. This is what you see sometimes when you don't wash regularly. And yes, I'm guilty, okay? Washing will take care of a lot of this. If you look at the list of pests, it's a fairly long list, um, starting with brown snail. They love to climb up into the tree. Rips, mites, white flies, aphid scale, glassy wing sharpshooter. Here's a great photo of 
down here in the lower right, these little brown things are all snails. I was out one day running errands after a rain, and as I got out of the car, and here you can see my car door, or part of it, uh, I came nose to nose with these snails. They had climbed up the tree to get out of the puddles. More critters, Diaprepis root weevil, leaf curl, which is citrus leaf miner, shot hole borer, Mexican fruit fly, and we've had a, a long quarantine uh, period in certain areas against the Mexican fruit fly. And the 800 pound gorilla these days is the Asian citrus psyllid, which we call ACP for short. And it's everywhere and it now carries Wang Long Bing bacteria or HLB. This is also called citrus greening. And I now have some good news to bring you about this. This has been um, threatening the California citrus injury, industry, and they've all been really nervous about it, for good reason. The Florida citrus industry was devastated by this creature. Last time I gave this, this talk was 2018, and I had the latest, and I went and got it from Tracy Kahn. She's the one who runs the UC Riverside Citrus Collection, uh, admittedly the best citrus collection in the world, and even the Chinese say so, and citrus came from China. So I'm going to do a compare and contrast for you. Um, this is how it was in 2018. They'd taken out 500 trees, only three of them in Riverside County that were infected, okay? The, the pest was everywhere, but had just begun to catch and transmit the bacterium, okay? Their approach was um, limit the population. They wanted everybody to be able to recognize the Asian citrus psyllid. And then they wanted you to treat it, uh, home gardeners to treat it at, at garden level. And they were recommending imidacloprid, which is a nicotinoid, which is, and that is misspelled, O-O-I-D. Um, it's, uh, that harms the bees and does a number of other bad things, okay? But this is what they knew to do. They also cautioned about budwood source. So if you, if you don't plan to graft your citrus yourself, don't worry about that. But Tracy wanted to be, oops, excuse me. Tracy wanted to be sure that everybody was aware of their program to build a cup. And I said, Tracy, what's a cup? Well, it turns out they were basically building a huge enclosure that was guaranteed to be uh, ACP tight. That is to say, to exclude ACPs and to begin to put two of every type of citrus in the collection into the cup. A monumental job. She was kind of looking for uh, donations, okay? This is 2018. Enter Dr. Mark Hodel. He's from UC Riverside. I went to a wonderful lecture that he gave through the UC IPM program last week. Um, so compare and contrast, 6,000 infected trees now, and this is 2024, but now the pest is in retreat. Why? Because he launched, headed up what's been about a two decade effort to go and find the natural enemies of the ACP, which is from Pakistan. So they went to Pakistan and they looked for natural enemies. They found two, but one well, turned out to be a, a no-go. The one that was successful is Tamarixia radiata. It's a little critter, a little parasitoid, looks like a little wasp. They identified it. They tested it first for efficacy, then for safety, then introduced it with permits, and it has spread successfully, and it's lowered the, pop, the ACP population everywhere it's been introduced. In other words, this is classic, it's good science, and it is totally successful. If you are interested, there are links in the handout to his one-hour presentation. If you're a science type, I highly recommend you go spend the hour and look at the whole story. I'm going to give you the bottom line. So if you're not the science type, fear not. 
soldier on with me, okay? One of the things that Hodel said was, this thing, this tamarixia, is better at identifying pest populations than the researchers, which I think is kind of an astonishing admonition. I've uh, pulled some charts from his presentation, three of them, four of them, I think, so bear with me. Here he's talking about how we're a huge citrus producer and have a whole lot at risk, all right? The Asian citrus psyllid was found in the county in 2008, San Diego County, and Wan Long Bing was detected, the bacterium, in 2012 in LA County, okay? They sprayed a whole lot and they spent a whole lot of money. The interesting thing, I think, is that the pair of the psyllid and its bacterium has almost exclusively been found in urban citrus. In other words, home gardens. Why? Probably because people have brought in citrus that was infected. And because we're, we can be pretty sure the growers haven't done that, not wishing to put their harvest and their livelihoods at risk. And of course, uh, there has been a spraying program in, in the commercial uh, orchards too. But okay, so, so basically he's saying the problem isn't with the homeowners. These are two charts that I'll just briefly show you. The upper left, this turquoise is the Asian citrus psyllid population. Up and down, up and down, up and down, depending on where and when they measured it. They introduced tamarixia, the purple, and lo and behold, the turquoise goes way down. If the turquoise jumps up, so does the purple. In other words, the tamarixia breeds more to take advantage of the citrus, Asian citrus psyllid population. And again, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You can see this is really low. It jumps up a little. Bingo. The tamarixia is right on it. And then out here, there's yet a little more and a huge response from tamarixia. So it's doing a very good job at finding and killing Asian citrus psyllid. And I'm sure he had, this study was doing counts to try and figure out where, where they were going along each year. And I'm sure there was some poor graduate students who had to do this we're looking at egg densities and nymphs. It turns out the Asian citrus psyllid is one of those that goes from egg through five instar, in other words, five development levels, each identifiable, resulting, and they all look kind of like the end result, which is the adult. And then after the fifth instar, it, the adult hatches. So, Egg densities declined by 92%, not bad. Small nymphs, first through third in stars, declined by 81. Large nymphs by 94, and adults by 75. In other words, they're doing a good job of knocking things down, both, uh, well, egg, nymphal, and adults, all right? And uh, they're trying to uh, assess how much of that tamarixia is responsible for. At the same time over here, they noted that where Argentine ants are present in the, in the orchards, there's a way greater density of eggs and nymphs and adults. In other words, the ants have a, a beneficial effect on the pest, all right? And then they talk about why they can't have measured blah, blah, blah. Like I say, good science looking at, okay, we brought something good about, was it really because of what we did? And when they went to answer that question, honestly, these guys are nuts. Uh, they got little bitty cameras with little bitty thumb drives. And in a number of places, they recorded 19,000 hours of videography. They found some poor grad student had a look at all that. They found 647 kilovants. Less than a third of them were from tamarixia. Almost two thirds of them were from serpid larva, which has been around all along. And about 12% from lacewing larva. Again, it's been around all along. I'll be darned. So 
they did a wonderful job of identifying this thing and bringing it in. It turns out it was aided with two things that were already here. And one of the things Hodel said was, relax your insecticide management a little. In other words, stop spraying so much. Let the natural enemies be recover. And oh, by the way, be beware insecticide resistance because that's what we always get when we spray. And instead, turn your attention to manage Argentine ants in your citrus. Same goes for the home person. Okay, we keep getting these new pests. You do need to be vigilant for Asian citrus psyllid. But basically, concentrate on taking good care of your trees. Consistent irrigation, feeding, hygiene, and look for ACPs, but treat for Argentine ants. There is a recipe for Argentine ant bait as recommended by Dr. Middleton, who is our county entomologist. I'm gonna briefly step through, because it's 1045. Cooking, zest, I've talked about that. I have a recipe for preserved lemons. You can go check that from the recording. I have two or, two or three photos. Um, I keep meeting up with this, this philosophy that says only poor people grow their own food. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I have these photos as counterexample. Um, you may remember the Western White House. Some of you were old enough. It's now called Casa Pacifica. We toured it. It's owned by no longer the Nixon family, but uh, by a gentleman named Mr. Herbert, who also owns Rogers Gardens, a lovely destination nursery in, in Costa Mesa. He has a working vegetable garden because his personal chef ordains that that's where the family will get its fruits and vegetables. And he can afford to have any food on the planet, I think. He made his money in pharmaceuticals. Gorgeous looking, okay, and all of it healthy. So I'm gonna answer the question. Yes, run out and pick a new cultivar. My choices are Kishu, Gold Nugget, and a Navel, and then a Lemon and a Mexican Lime. But your, your numbers may vary, okay? Choose what you like, find the perfect place, enjoy it in your landscape, then bring it into your kitchen and into your life. And I've got, again, this stuff is in the handout, the citrus variety collection at UC Riverside, the clonal protection program, which we don't need so much now because we know to go after Argentine ants. Uh, a lot of rare fruit grower things. Remember this last bullet. Uh, you can just Google citrus websites, but if they're not targeting California, they may not be giving you good information, particularly if they're targeting Florida. It's good for them, but it's not applicable to us. Questions? Um, were you guys, Shirley uh, and Banya, were you, uh, do we have anything in chat? We do not. <laughs> I hope I, well, I don't know if I do hope that I answered all their questions. I have a question. Good. Do citrus cross pollinate? pollinate? I have a, a mandarin tangerine in my backyard and no. it's maybe three feet from my fence where my neighbor has three large lemon trees right up against the fence. So they're very, very close. And I swear my tangerines are not as sweet anymore. And I'm wondering if his lemons are affecting it, but I'm just asking. Shouldn't be, but it is possible. Okay. Um, let's see. I know that citrus trees will occasionally revert a little to their older parentage. And I don't know how much lemon parentage is in your mandarin. Mm -hmm. uh, they will, for instance, get thorns when they may, some of them may not start with thorns. They will be thornless, but they will later develop thorns. So some of that can happen because of what's in the tree. It shouldn't happen, but interesting question. And I need to go do some more research. I owe you an answer. Well, thanks. I yeah, I don't know. I was thinking of covering my tree or something. 
We do have a lot of questions coming in now. Oh, good. And as we do that, I'm going to step through the three pages of the handout just so that they will be part of your recording. So hit me with a question. Okay, so um, one is, do you have ant recipes? Oh, let's see, is this? Yes, but here's the second page of the handout. Eric Middleton's recipe for Argentine ant poison. Oh, good. One quarter sucrose to water and add to that 0.5% boric acid by weight. Easy, low toxicity, you don't want to kill them right off. You want them to take it back to the nest and poison all their buddies. Sounds like Another. a plan. Okay. Yeah. And then Nancy would like to know, how do we treat leaf curl? Uh, rinse. Let's see. Where is... Let's see. What I want to do is go back... Um, leaf curl, which is really citrus leaf minor. Um, almost all the uh, trees, if you go to any nursery, big box or or private, whatever, in other words, full service, almost all the trees are infested with citrus leaf minor. And you look at the leaf and you'll find little wiggly tracks in it, in the leaf. It won't kill a tree. It probably won't even affect it hardly at all, unless it's a, a babe with very few leaves. But it's kind of like grin and bear it. Okay. And, and another question, can you explain more about how to wash a tree? Well, it's kind of like washing an elephant if it's big, but I have a I I have an adjustable hose and sprayer. So it allows me to turn it on the water on or off, and it allows me to affect the mix from very little to quite a lot. And it has a, a, um, a reservoir, and I put, I like to put 50-50 New Dawn in water because New Dawn is so viscous that I can't believe it's not going to gum things up. Just my own peculiar. You, you can just put any kind of detergent in there. And you want to wash... Um, for instance, uh, aphids, uh, put out honeydew and that's why some of the, um, here we go. Whoops. Uh, some of these things will go after the honeydew and the ants in particular will go after the honeydew. Washing the leaves will wash off a lot of the honeydew because it's, it's water-based. It's just nothing but a sugar solution, if you will. Um, so you want to try and wash both sides of every leaf. Well, obviously, you're not going to hold the leaf one at a time and wash it. You're just going to um, I, I walk all the way around the tree and try and do from top to bottom with the uh, hose end sprayer. Because I live at the beach, I very seldom, if ever, have to rinse because it doesn't get hot. So and then can, about timing, is it okay to wash in full sun or better to wait till later in the day? If you wash in full sun, then rinse. But, or wait till later in the day. In other words, you're probably not going to burn the tree. And you don't want to use a whole lot of soap solution. It shouldn't be foaming on the tree. It should just feel soapy to your hand. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And one person has mushrooms growing on top of the soil under her newly potted kumquat. Interesting. They're in the soil then. What you're seeing is the fruiting bodies. You're not seeing all the mycelia, the roots, if you will, that are into the soil. I would expect that something is died and rotting in there in terms of maybe the compost you used wasn't fully composted, maybe. Um, it's, you know, if they're unsightly, you can pull off the fruiting bodies. They're not hurting anything. Um, fungus is good, okay? Fungus in the soil does a lot of useful things. So whereas a lot of bacterium are not good, fungus is fine. 
Okay. That scratch that is. And then um, for leaf miner, can you just pick off the leaves that that are infected? Is that a solution? No, um, that'll get rid of some of the leaves. But since it's not doing a lot of harm, other than looking kind of crummy, uh, the tree probably needs those leaves to make chlorophyll. You think? So don't be don't be tearing them off if you don't need to. Okay. And you already did answer this question in, in your talk about the washing. The, a person was asking, what is the ratio of soap and water? And you said 50-50. Yeah. Well, that's what I put in the container, and then I dial my dial to like one or two. So not a lot of it is used. Okay. That's it on the questions. Does anybody else want to speak up with a question? Oh my God, I put them all to sleep. I have a question. Uh, for uh, uh, like a small lime, for example, grown in a pot, you mentioned something about roots. Uh, do, you, you, do you have to do anything special oh. over many years? Root pruning? Um, yeah. What will happen over many years, you may notice that the soil level and the tree keeps going down. What you mm -hmm. want to do, ideally, tip the pot over, tip out the root ball, which will probably be pretty solid. Put some fresh additional soil in the bottom mm. and then replace the root ball so it's now up to, you know, a couple inches from the top of the, where you where it started. and. Okay fresh around the sides. Um, if you have something like a fig, and I had, I put, at one point I put two figs in the pot. They are very aggressive. In their case, they filled the pot in the space of a couple years and were looking to get out the hole in the bottom. For them, I tip it out, cut off the outer, say, inch or so, inch or two, depending on how big the pot is of the roots, and again, repot with fresh soil around the edge. It's a fairly big deal because the pot's pretty heavy. Yeah. Now, now my pot would be way too heavy. I'd have to have a couple people help me. Now, yeah. the other uh, issue is um, uh, the hole in the bottom of one of these pots. I had a nicely growing, small, um, bearless, I think you call them yeah. lime, yeah, yeah, in a pot. Yeah. It was growing beautifully uh, until... Uh, the last uh, not this winter but last winter when it rained a whole lot and i couldn't get the pot tipped enough um and uh it filled with water and uh, gradually my poor plant drowned and so the to make sure that the hole in the bottom is big enough to drain well uh, do you have any advice on that what you're describing is similar to what i had with my pair of figs uh, they were so aggressive, one put a root down through the hole. Mm -hmm. And the root was about as big as the hole. And I didn't realize till later I observed what you observed. The water was sitting in the top of the pot. Yeah. It because became it a... couldn't drain, not because it rained so much, but because the hole in the pot was full of a root. I would suggest you see if you could tip your pot just enough to figure out, well, maybe it's too late now. It's much too late now. I have to restart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, start with a hard saucer under the pot. A hard saucer, or I've also used, oh, like, they have those white plastic cutting boards in the kitchen. And you can get ones that are almost two by three. What you want is to deny the plant the ability to put a root through the hole and into the soil so if okay. it tries to go through the hole what it finds is a cutting board a ceramic saucer. something over the hole you're saying yeah, yeah. Under, okay. the hole. under the hole under the hole yeah and maybe even uh my neighbors was suggesting a uh kind of this mesh to put over the hole inside the pot but that that might help as well that keeps the soil from falling through, and I do that too. Mm. But these plants are pretty aggressive. They want to grow, remember? it's They are, if they try and get out of that hole, it's because they want something. 
more water, more nutrients, or, you know, or, or a fun, good time in town. I don't know. But they'll put little roots under your piece of uh, screening. And once they find the hole and find there's water there, down they go. So mm. that won't, that's not enough. They, yes, they they're like, yeah. Okay. I have one other question while I'm on. Um, I absolutely totally love uh, these Thai grown pomelos, but I they not don't seem to be grown here. You get uh, they have a slightly sweeter flavor than um, grapefruit, and they're of course much bigger. I love um, them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 any is there? Do, why can't they be grown in California, or why aren't they grown, or what's the issue with them growing? In this I think it's only that uh, the market isn't there. And of course, the growers are interested in making money. And so most people don't know what that thing is. It's big and it looks funny. And you it's a certain amount of trouble to peel. I know because every when it's in season, I always get one or two and let them ripen up and then enjoy them with great ceremony and a big mess. It you can buy them here then. You say there's a season uh, here? Yeah, it's um, uh, seems to me I saw them. We, we just came from San Luis Obispo County yesterday. I saw them up there. Uh, very often sprouts will have a few. Um, sometimes Trader Joe will have a few. They're not a lot. And I suspect that's because they don't move very fast. But okay. if you can find a tree, you can grow one. Oh, okay. And they grow with, I mean, these are, uh... They grow very well uh, in certain part of Thailand, and they're not that messy. Once you get the outside off, there's Once a lot the inside. Yeah. 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 And they're fantastically delicious. <laughs> I think so, and they also use them for breeding. Uh, oh, it's well, I can't remember. There's one of the citrus, and I was oh so fond of saying, and one of his parents is Pamelo. Pamelo. Hmm. So, they so I'm, I'm assuming yeah. you can't grow them in a pot. I'm assuming the tree ha it would be quite big. Yeah, I'm betting it would be, and and I don't. I haven't looked for a tree. You might. Oh, uh, what is it? Western, Western growers. There are a couple of citrus growers in the Bay Area who will do mail order, and mm -hmm. they tend to have more. Um, Blind dragon stock, but it's you know it's a little it's a little harder to get it by mail and get it you know mm -hmm. a viable tree. Give it a try. Okay. All right. I have another question from the chat. Uh, Can you add pure neem oil to the dilute soap water soap and water um, wash to control aphids? Uh, I wouldn't add the two. No, because the neem oil you want the oil to coat, you want the detergent to break the surface tension and um, and wet. They're going in opposite directions. Uh, you. you can use neem oil. It's not hugely effective, but you can do it, but do it separately. And then one last question. I know we're getting to the end. Um, huh. I'm interested in growing a kumquat in a pot like you showed us. Um, do you have a recommendation for the variety I should, I might want to try? I went with Maywa, which is um, a little sweeter fruit. They all have sweet rinds, but the mm -hmm. other one, and let's see, oh dear. Let me share my screen real quick. Uh... Kumquat, Maywa, or, oh, fiddle. I can't, it was cut off right before then. Um, sweet rind, yeah. And the other one is, let me put my glasses on, slightly tart rind. So I, I'd say go with a Maywa. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this. I hope I've given you all um, impetus to just rush out do a little more um, research and get yourself a new citrus. That's so helpful. Thank you. Oh, one last question. What time of year 
would you spray neem oil if you choose to do that? You can probably do it anytime. Um, a horticultural oil per se is often used on bare root or on bare trees. Citrus, of course, are evergreen and never have a bare tree season, you know, so it, it doesn't matter. Okay, and one last comment for you. Thank you for your inspiration. <laughs> Everyone thanks you very much. It was a great session. You're a mm -hmm. great audience. Thanks. You guys take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.